Hi, I'm Jerry, and this is a 2000 word guide, more or less, to the world's first fighter aircraft. In my video on the first warplane and the first bomber, I've played a bit fast and loose with my definition, but the circumstances of both were appropriate for the reasoning I've applied. The Blériot Type 11 was the first aircraft used in wartime for reconnaissance, and the Ehrlich Tauber was the first aircraft used for a bombing mission both under the auspices of the Italian Aviation Division during the Italian-Turkish War of 1911-1912. Aircraft by their nature are obvious candidates for both purposes. A senior officer points at a location on a map and wants to know what is there, or cause whatever is there to experience a significant morale problem by dropping a few grenades on it, and an aircraft is clearly the best and fastest means of achieving those goals. To observers of these actions it must have been clear very quickly that some method of preventing themselves from being scouted out or bombed would be necessary, and the only way of doing this would be an aircraft specifically designed for the job. The requirements would have practically written themselves. Such a plane would need to be faster than their proposed target so they could be caught, and sufficiently armed to shoot them down. The armament would pretty much have to be a machine gun. Revolvers, semi-automatic pistols, shotguns, bolt-action rifles, or even the few semi-automatic rifles that existed would clearly be unsuitable unless the pilot could be hit, and anyone with shooting experience would have been able to explain how difficult this was, especially at range, and even more so from moving vehicles. So something that could put out significant volume of fire was going to be necessary, and the only thing vaguely light enough to mount on an aircraft was a machine gun of some description. In 1912, the British Admiralty issued a specification for the development of an aircraft specifically designed to destroy other aircraft, and the Vickers Limited Aviation Department took up the challenge. Note that this was only nine years after the Wright brothers' first powered flight, and three years after Louis Blériot flew across the Channel, and the Italian-Turkish War was still in progress, so not only were aircraft development proceeding extremely quickly, someone clearly saw the necessity for a fighter aircraft. Incidentally, they weren't officially called fighters at the time. A generally used term in the English language was scout or pursuit aircraft, but I'll stick with fighters. One of the major problems was where to stick the machine gun. It couldn't be fired through the propeller for obvious reasons, so the decision was made to put the propeller behind the cockpit in what is known as a pusher configuration. This had been previously pioneered by the Frenchman Gabriel Voisin and Henri Farmont, and would have seemed a perfectly reasonable solution. It was not necessarily clear at the time that the preferred position of the machine gun was fixed facing forwards, so the pilot could aim at a target by aiming the entire aircraft. While air-to-air -air combat with guns is quite a complex operation, this configuration simplifies matters a bit. Without this knowledge, however, it seems reasonable to assume that a flexible gun position would give the most options while shooting, so Vickers' thinking was to make their fighter a two-seater, with the gunner right forwards in the nose to give him the best field of fire, and put the pilot behind him. This would add extra weight and have an effect on performance, to be sure, but there are benefits to this arrangement as well. The pilot could focus on flying, the gunner could focus on shooting, and then there are the advantages of teamwork and companionship in combat. So what machine gun to use? Vickers at the time was manufacturing what was one of the best heavy machine guns in the world, so it seems reasonable that they would use it. Now I haven't been able to find specific problems with this, though problems there were, but I can think of a couple of issues with the Vickers heavy machine gun that would cause problems. One is that it is heavy. At around 50 pounds, that is a lot of weight to move around when speed is necessary. Also, we're talking about early aircraft here, so any weight saving is a bonus. The main problem that I see is that it is a belt-fed machine gun. On the ground, it requires one man to feed the belt during firing, but this isn't possible in the air. Also, if you're going to be swinging the gun around in a confined area, that belt is going to get in the way and hang up on bits of aircraft or get twisted and generally fail to feed reliably at a time when you need it most. 
These issues were actually resolved in later fighters that used the same gun as forward-facing armament. By 1913, Vickers had ditched their heavy machine gun in favour of a Lewis light machine gun. This was a much better solution to the problem. At only 28 pounds, it represented a significant weight saving. It was more manoeuvrable as a result, and because it fed from a pan magazine atop the breech, there was no risk of causing a failure to feed by hanging up the belt. Ammunition capacity was down from a 250 round belt to a 47 round drum, but that could be resolved by carrying extra magazines, and anyway, it's better to have a functional gun than ammunition that cannot be used. A couple of weeks after Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Gavrilo Princip in Sarajevo, thus facilitating the outbreak of World War I, Vickers had their first fighter ready for its first flight. After two years of development, the Vickers Fighting Biplane No. 5, hereafter referred to as the FB-5, made its first flight on July 17, 1914. As you might surmise, the development process had not been without incident. The experimental fighting biplane No. 1 was designed by George Henry Challenger and Archibald Archie Ree Lowe. They came up with a pusher-type, unequal-span, staggered biplane two-seater featuring wing warping for lateral control. Armament was a Vickers heavy machine gun in a ball and socket mount. It was displayed at an aero show in Olympia in February of 1913 and attracted favourable comment, including the use of a flexible mount for the armament, which was regarded as necessary for aerial combat. Unfortunately, it crashed during its maiden flight. The cause of the crash is attributed to it being nose-heavy due to the presence of the armament. Despite this, the design was considered to have promise and work continued. Improvements resulted in the EFB-2. These moved the wings so that they were unstaggered. Large celluloid windows were inserted into the fuselage, presumably so that the field of view was improved. My immediate impression looking at it is that the gunner's position is cramped and his field of fire is restricted. Accidentally or not, they do seem to have been approaching the ideal of having the gun fire mostly forwards. Test flying commenced in the autumn of 1913, but it crashed in October that same year. Pushing on, Archie Lowe modified the design again to produce the EFB-3. This removed the windows, redesigned the forward nacelle, and replaced wing warping with ailerons, which can only have been a significant improvement. Wing warping was in some ways too advanced a concept for the materials technology of the time, potentially compromising the structural integrity of the wing. Ailerons were a simpler and more effective alternative. It is no accident that ailerons have been the control surface of choice for a hundred years, and it is only recently with modern technology that wing warping is seeing a potential comeback. The Admiralty was sufficiently impressed to order six prototype aircraft for further testing. It was this aircraft that gave rise to the FB-5. The EFB-3 was displayed at the 1914 Olympia Aero Show. In a curious side note, the German military approached Vickers for information on their fighting biplanes in early 1914. There was nothing unusual about this. They had similarly approached other British manufacturers. It really was a different world back then, and so there was nothing particularly sinister about this. Probably. A quick perusal of back issues of Flight magazine shows pretty much everything about new aircraft around this time was in the public domain. The Germans ended up not accepting Vickers' designs. In order to properly account for the variant numbers I need to digress briefly, Vickers made further changes resulting in the EFB-4. The nacelle was designed again, resulting in a more streamlined structure. The cumbersome and restrictive ball and socket mount was replaced with a spigot mount, allowing better field of fire, and the heavy machine gun replaced with the Lewis light machine gun. It also featured a twin boom tail. Although it was never built, some features of the FP-4 were present in Archie Lowe's final design, the FP-5, most especially the gun and mount. In summary, the FP-5 was a pusher configuration two-seater biplane with the gunner right forward and the pilot seated behind him. Armament was a single Lewis light machine gun on a spigot mount, allowing a fairly wide field of fire.
Its structure was tubular steel with wire bracing. By the standards of the time it was a clean design. Power was provided by a gnome monosupape nine-cylinder rotary engine delivering a hundred horsepower for a top speed of seventy miles an hour. Endurance was a respectable four and a half hours, giving it a range of two hundred and fifty miles. Initially the FB-5 trickled out to squadrons in ones and twos, and it was one of these supplements to number six squadron of the Royal Flying Corps at Nether Avon on Salisbury Plain, Wiltshire, England, that first saw action. Three had been delivered, but two were relocated to Joyce Green Airfield to form the nucleus of London's air defence. On December 25, 1914, an FB-5 took off from Joyce Green to engage an Etrich Tauber that had been spotted over the coast. With 2nd Lieutenant M. R. Chidson at the controls and a Corporal Martin behind the Lewis gun, they engaged the enemy aircraft. Demonstrating that shooting down an aircraft from another aircraft is actually difficult, it isn't certain that the Tauber was shot down. Certainly it was never officially confirmed. This, though, was the first known air-to-air -air action of an FB-5. FB-5s first appeared on the Western Front in February of 1915, with Number 2 Squadron receiving the first sample. Other squadrons received aircraft in limited numbers, but it wasn't until July of 1915 that the first genuine fighter squadron can be said to have been established, being entirely equipped with FB-5s. This was Number 11 Squadron of the Royal Flying Corps. Number 18 Squadron, deployed in November of that same year, also exclusively flew FP-5s. In general, the FP-5 can only be considered a qualified success. It proved to be too slow to properly perform its designed role, and the engine was unreliable, though this was partly due to poor maintenance resulting from poor training of the mechanics. This is illustrated by the fact that only one pilot gunner team achieved A status in the aircraft. These were Captain Lionel Wilmot Brabazon Rees and Flight Sergeant James McKinley Hargreaves. Together they accounted for eight enemy aircraft. The deployment of the FB-5 more or less coincided with the appearance of the Fokker Eindecker and was unable to compete with the latter aircraft, which was faster, better armed and a generally superior fighter that led to a degree of German air superiority over the Western Front between August 1915 and early 1916 during a period known as the Fokker Scourge. The FB-5 served until mid-1916 when more effective Allied fighters were available. A total of 224 were built, both by the British and under license to the French and Danish, but these and a limited number of the improved FB-9s were Vickers' only significant contribution to the aircraft of World War I. No originals exist. A flying replica of the FB-5 was completed in 1966 and flew until late 1968. It is now an exhibit at the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon near London. If you enjoyed this content and would like more of the same, please like and subscribe.